in the house of God. Amen. Uh, coming up out of a uh, truly a wonderful weekend, uh, both in Texas and uh, here at home. And uh, just so thankful that God has moved upon his people as he has. And uh, looking forward to what God has in store for our future. I just want to make sure this is live streaming. We didn't get an error, did we? It's live streaming? Okay. Um, the red light on here is a little narrow, so I just wondered. But I want to take a moment here and just pray and ask God to be with us um, for the rest of this Bible study. Uh, we want to pray for Zoe, uh, Sister Mary's daughter. Uh, she is going to the ER right now. She's just having just extreme nosebleeds, and it's coming out of her nose and out of her mouth. And uh, she did that yesterday, and then she's doing it again today. And so we want to pray for her that God would, uh, that God would heal, that God would touch, uh, and strengthen her even now. And uh, we believe that God is able to do that. And um, we just want to pray that God would just open up our hearts and our minds to receive the engrafted word of God, which is able to save our souls. And so. Uh, I love the word of God. I think the word of God is the most wonderful thing that the Lord ever gave humanity. Uh, and you say, well, what about Jesus? Well, he is the word of God. <laughs> so it is the most wonderful thing that God ever gave us was his word, uh, both uh, in, in, in the person of Christ Jesus and also uh, in this wonderful book that we get to read. Uh, because the more we take this book and put it in our hearts, or we become like God. And that is an awesome thing. Can you imagine that? God would take humanity, put his word in them, make them like him, so that then we can turn around and rule and reign with Christ uh, when he gives us those immortal bodies. Wow, man. It's incredible, isn't it? It's incredible. But let's pray, and let's ask God to be with us, and then uh, we will hear from the word of God. Lord, we thank you so much. For this honor and opportunity to be in your house once again. Lord, we never take this for granted, Lord. It is such an honor for us, God, that you would call us into your house, Lord, to hear from your word, God, that your secrets, Lord, that the thoughts of your mind, that the thoughts of your heart would be revealed unto us, God, by your word, oh God. What an incredible honor it is for humanity to have such a wonderful thing at our disposal. So we just open up this prayer with saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for this moment. Thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for those who have gathered, will gather, God, those that are watching over uh, live stream. Lord, we just thank you so much for all that you're doing as you move among us. Lord, as you speak to us, God, as you deliver, God. Lord, we just thank you, God, for the souls that are being saved and for the lives that are being transformed. We just thank you so much. Thank you, Jesus. We give you praise, oh God. We give you glory and honor, Lord. We worship you and magnify you, for great is your faithfulness toward us, O oh Lord God. You are great and greatly to be praised, so we give you the honor and the glory. Lord, we pray over Zoe right now, God. Lord, we just speak your word, God, into her body, Lord. For you said you were wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon you, and by your stripes, Lord, we are healed. You said you sent forth your word to heal our diseases, O oh God. So even now, Lord God, touch her, Lord. Send your word, O oh God, only, and we know that she will be made whole in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we believe you to do that for her even now. And Lord, we pray, God, for this time. We pray for this moment, God. As we open your word, as we break the bread of your word, Lord. Lord, we pray that you would give us wisdom and understanding, God. We pray that when we leave here today, that we will have knowledge and understanding that we did not have prior to coming. Lord, help us. Touch our minds. Open us, open us up, Lord God. Help us to receive that engrafted word. That when we leave here, we'll be more like you than we were when we came. And Lord, we will give you praise, glory, and honor for all of it. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, amen and amen. Praise God. Well, I want to I wanna talk tonight uh, from, from this uh, subject, the response and responsibility of and to the ministry. Uh, because the way the church works, it cannot have just ministry. It also has to have those the ministry is leading. 
And it can't just have those the ministry is leading. It has to have also the ministry. Uh, God established the church uh, on the day of Pentecost. Uh, he established it through his apostles. Uh, the Bible says that the church uh, is built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself, the chief cornerstone. Uh, if you look at that woman in Revelation, the 12th chapter, uh, she's clothed uh, with the sun. The moon is under her feet. And 12 stars are upon her head. And of course, then if you go in uh, to Revelation, uh, the first chapter, uh, going into the second chapter, and uh, you see, uh, you see uh, Jesus walking in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Uh, and the Bible says that he had seven stars in his hand. And the stars were representatives of the pastors uh, and the leaders of those seven churches. And, uh, and, and, and from what I can see from my perspective, uh, as the church unfolded, because we know it, is, it was first uh, inaugurated in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, uh, and the church began to unfold. And in every city, there were multiple uh, churches, uh, and this was, nece this was ne necessary because of the lack of transportation and travel. And they had many households, uh, and which elders were placed uh, within those households that would help to lead and guide uh, those saints that would gather in that specific house, uh, but also there was a bishop that was put in that city, such as uh, uh, Timothy to Ephesus, uh, Titus to Crete. And so the church was established uh, in its governing power by Jesus Christ, ultimately through his apostles. And so the only way we know how to run the church, to govern the church, or even what the church looks like, is to go into the word of God and to let it be established from there. Um, I, I am a huge proponent of everything has to be established by the word of God. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of dysfunction and there's a lot of corruption within the church, uh, ultimately because much of the church is not established upon the word of God. It's established upon uh, philosophy of men. It's established upon opinion of man. Uh, but if we are going to build a church in this last day that is going uh, to, 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 to uh, turn the world upside down, it is going to have to be a church that is deeply rooted and grounded within the word of God. There is no way around this. It has to be governed by the scripture. And so uh, last, uh, last time we did our Bible study, I talked about the qualifications uh, of ministry. And if you missed that, uh, if you're watching online, if you missed that, I encourage you to go back. Uh, two Mondays from now and uh, look at that Bible study because I believe it will touch your heart. It will make you understand what you need to be in order to operate within the function uh, of an official office within the church. Uh, and, 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 and it's all given by the word of God. We just went scripture by scripture and uh, because we know that all things must be established by the word of God. So let's go to Ephesians 4 and we're going to start at verse 8 and many of you all will know exactly where I'm headed uh, before we even turn there uh, who are Bible students this is a powerful scripture um, because there must be a response from the congregation to the ministry and then there also is a responsibility from the ministry to the congregation and we have got to meet each of us in whatever function that is we have to meet those responsibilities in order for the church uh, to function uh, uh, as fluidly as God would desire it to. And so let's talk about this. Uh, the Bible said, wherefore he, speaking of Jesus Christ, when he ascended upon high, he led captivity captive, which just means he took captive all those things that made captive. Uh, he made an open show on his cross uh, over principalities and powers and triumphed over them. And then it says here, uh, and he gave gifts unto men. Now, he qualifies uh, here, Paul does, who that is, and we know it's Jesus Christ. So going down to verse 11, he says, and he gave some. Now, we have to understand that, that, that verse 8 is not disconnected from verse 11. In fact, verse 8 uh, functions uh, as, a, as a precursor to let us know what these gifts are. Who are these gifts? And he said unto some, he, and, and he gave some apostles and some prophets 
and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And so ultimately, we cannot look at the ministry as uh, as slaves. We can't look at the ministry uh, as as uh, overlords. We can't look at the ministry as uh, those who are trying to hurt or, hurt us or harm us. Uh, all of that has to go away. And I'm not saying and I don't want to say that there is that there would be no uh, justification uh, in the hearts of the people uh, at being uh, skeptical of the ministry because the ministry has done that to itself uh, through the corruption, through scandal, uh, through salacious living. All of these things have produced uh, a hesitation uh, within the, the saints to trust the ministry. But if the church is to be restored to the place it must be in order for us to reach this generation in the capacity that we're being called to, the trust of the pew must be restored to the pulpit. It just has to happen. And the ministry cannot be looked at uh, uh, with, 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 with scandalous eyes. Uh, not every man of God is out there trying to scandalize the name of God or trying to scandalize or smear the name of the work of God. Uh, men of, there are men of God out there really trying to do this right. They really are purely motivated uh, to accomplish the assignment that God has given to them. And in order for them to do so, the pew is going to have to say, Lord, I'm going to see the ministry as a gift. I'm going to see that as something given to me, uh, something that you intended to give. Because Paul is not saying I gave gifts unto men. He's saying that Jesus gave these gifts unto men. And so when we look at apostles, when we look at prophets, when we look at evangelists and pastors and teachers, we have to look at them as gifts that God has given to us. To do what? For the perfecting of the saints or for the full equipping of the saints so that the saints can do the work of the ministry. All right. That's the job of every minister. The job of every minister is to teach, uh, especially those who are in pastoral ministry, uh, is to teach uh, the saints how to work the ministry. Uh, no man is an island to himself. No man can accomplish anything on his own. I don't care how powerful we feel. I don't care how anointed we feel. If you do not have people that are following you faithfully and that are working with you, you can't accomplish anything. You could be the greatest preacher that God ever put on planet Earth. But if you never have people that will work with you, you will accomplish absolutely nothing uh, because it takes the body of Christ to accomplish the work of God. And so we have to see them as gifts that are preparing us to do the work of the ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come into the unity of the faith. And of the knowledge of the son of God. And to a perfect man. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That seems improbable. But it is not. The ministry is here. Uh, Paul said. Uh, My little children of whom I travail in birth. Until Christ be formed in you. That is the responsibility of every man of God that is given oversight over a congregation is that he travails, he works, he pushes, he prays, he weeps if necessary, whatever it takes so that the pew is not excited alone. But they're growing, they're maturing, they're developing, uh, they're, 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 they're being delivered, uh, they're being set free, chains are being broken, yokes are being destroyed. In their lives, strongholds are coming down in their lives. That is the responsibility of a minister. And that doesn't just, that is not relegated alone to the sanctuary. That means also he's got to deal with things in their homes, deal with things in their hearts, deal with things in their minds. Why? Because the ultimate goal is to present to Christ. Paul said that I must present you to Christ a chaste virgin. That's my job. That's the job of every man of God. And so when I hear men of God, well, we don't need to deal with sin. How can you present a chaste virgin before Christ unless you are by the word of God, uh, having help of the Holy Ghost, 
pulling those, that carnality out of them, delivering them uh, from every evil thought, helping them to cast down every thought and imagination. How in the world can you do that if you will not deal with sin? Because sin is ultimately the, what produces uh, those thoughts. Sin is ultimately what produces that behavior. And so for us to not deal with sin, no wonder the enemy came into the church to deceive us to stop dealing with sin. Because he knows that's what got Adam and Eve in, the, in trouble in the garden. That's what caused this whole problem. So if I can get them to ignore sin and just think somehow because Christ died on the cross that they're ultimately made righteous no matter what they do, then they will never, ever be conformed to the image of Christ. They will never, ever be a chaste virgin. And ultimately, he then has conquered the church through apostasy and false doctrine. My job is to beat the buzzards off the sacrifice. My job is to come to you and say, no, saints of God. There's still sin in us. There's still works of rebellion in us. There's still carnality in us. And, and, and none of us want to see it. All of us want to feel like we're doing okay. But then the word of God comes forth and you go, oh, Lord, I'm not where I thought I was. <laughs> and that's the job of the ministry because our job is to build you to the measure of the, full, of the, measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That henceforth we be no more children. Tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine. We just talked about this. By the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. There are ministry, there is ministry out there that is looking to deceive. Their whole desire is to deceive. They're lying in wait. They're, they've set traps for God's people. And they're just lying in wait to deceive. Our job is to defend the sheep from the wolves. That's our job. Because we're not hirelings. We're shepherds. A hireling, when the enemy comes in, they'll flee to save their own life. But a good shepherd will lay his life down for the sheep. And if that means ridicule, if that means slander, if that means, uh, uh, if that means uh, being belittled or demeaned, uh, ostracized, alienated, whatever would take place as a result of a man of God really exposing the lies and opening the hearts of the people of God to truth, that is worth it if it saves the sheep. And I want to say this, if you're not willing to take that kind of stuff, get out the ministry. You're not called to be there. It's a career for you. It's not a calling. Just get out. If you can't take slander, if you can't take criticism, if you can't take that stuff, just get out of the ministry. Just go flip hamburgers, go get a college education, do whatever you're going to do. But don't be in the ministry because <laughs> you are not going to be praised all the time in this thing. Uh, the same people that will praise you tomorrow will slander you the next day. The same people that will lift you up one day will be the ones trying to tear you down the next day. It's part of the job. It's part of the assignment. It is part of our responsibility. That's what we're going to come under. Jesus said, they hated me, they'll hate you. They that desire to live godly in this present world shall suffer persecution. It's just going to happen. Accept it. But your job is not to flee to save your own life. Now, it doesn't mean that you run away from the church. There are a lot of men running away from the truth to spare their ego. Still with the flock, just running away from the truth to spare the criticism. But real men of God will stand in the face of the wolf and dare him to bite because they are empowered with the Holy Ghost. They're called of God. They've got the sword of the spirit in their hand and they will stand there and defend the sheep to the death if that's what it takes. That is the responsibility of the ministry. Praise God. Because there are wolves just waiting. They've laid traps for the people. Because to them, it's not about transformation. To them, it's not about being conformed to Christ. To them, it's not about repentance. To them, it's about numbers, finances, buildings, cars, houses. That's not a real shepherd. That's not a real shepherd. Now, it doesn't mean that a man of God doesn't need to be paid. And we're going to talk about that here shortly. But what it does mean is that your motivation is not to be paid 
for ministry. In fact, at one point, Paul said it was my hands that took care of my necessities. Later on, he apologized that he had uh, that he had uh, not given them opportunity uh, to be the blessing that they should have been. But ultimately, God called men are not in it for the money. They're in it for the ministry. They're in it for the teaching and the instruction of the sheep. And, and when I see when I see so many ministers willing to compromise to the person who puts the most money in the offering plate, then that person is not called of God. That person is not called. If they were, they've horribly defiled themselves. And they just need to go sit down and repent and try to be restored later on. Because real men of God will look at the person who gives the most money in the offering plate and call out their sin, just like he will the person who gives the widow's mites. Because it's about souls. Amen. Amen. It's about souls. Because God will take care of us anyways. But he said, but speaking the truth in love doesn't mean that it's going to feel good when it comes out. It just means that you're saying that because you love them. A lot of this speaking the truth in love will use flowery words and, you know, and, 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 and high voices and uplifting words. No, truth is spoken because you love them. That's what this is talking about. It just means you speak the truth because you love them. And sometimes you just say what is necessary. When Paul rebuked Peter in Antioch, boy, that was harsh. That was a powerful rebuke. He said, you're to blame. You're causing all this dissension. You're causing all this division. You're the problem, Peter. But Peter knew later on, after Paul had already been killed, when, 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 he, wrote his, uh, when he wrote his epistle, he said, our dearly beloved brother Paul. He knew that even though Paul had corrected him, Paul had rebuked him, that Paul had done it because he loved him. And so don't think because sometimes rebuke is harsh. Jesus loved the Pharisees, but he said, you generation of vipers. He said, you, he said, you widen sepulchers. He said, you clean up the outside of the cup, but inwardly you're full of excess and extortion. I mean, he loved them, but he spoke the truth because he loved them. And so get this out of your head, this euphoric idea uh, that when a man of God speaks the truth in love, that it's going to sound lovely. Sometimes it's going to come direct. Sometimes it's going to feel harsh. But a man who is willing to take the chance for you to walk away from him and still tell you the truth anyways, God, a man of God loves you. Hang with that. Hang with that one. Because he's the one that loves you. But it says here, uh, for whom... Uh, but speaking the truth, that we may grow up into him in all things, which is the head of Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together, compacted by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working uh, in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. I was so blessed. I was so blessed uh, to see how many people came on Sunday morning, even though they knew that I was not going to be here. I was so blessed to see how the power of God moved in this place on Sunday morning, even though I was not here. I was so blessed to hear Brother Jonathan preach such a wonderful message, even though I was not going to be here. What that is telling me is, is that I am building this church by the help of God into Christ because Christ is the head. I'm not the head. No, I'm not. I'm just a member of this body. Now, I am the leader. I am the overseer. But I'm not the head of this body. Christ is the head. So if Christ is the head, then whether the pastor's here or not, the body's going to show up. It's the truth. I mean, <laughs> we don't have, I don't want to, I don't want no headless horsemen around here. I don't want a headless body around here. I want Christ to be the head of this church. And when the head shows up, the whole body is here. Why? Because all of the blessings come down from the father of lights. And God can use anyone, whether I'm here or not, to minister unto the needs of the saints. And he did, and he has, and he will continue to do so because we're being built up into Christ. Because Christ is the head of this church. I'm here to oversee and lead as Christ leads me, but ultimately, he's the head of the church. And if you're anywhere where Christ is not the head of the church, I encourage you to leave quickly. I do, because Christ has got to be the head. If, if, if we're going to church... And a pastor's not there and nobody shows up. 
Christ is not the head. If, if, if worship can't happen, if the pastor's not there, Christ is not the head. If the saints cannot be ministered to because the pastor's not there, Christ is not the head. That's just the way it is. How do you know Christ is the head? Because with or without the preacher or the pastor, everything is functioning as it would, as if he was there. Why? Because Christ is the head. And the head is what gives all of the orders to the body. And so I was so encouraged this weekend to see how the Lord moved because I thought, Lord, thank you for allowing us to build the saints into Jesus Christ. That's a wonderful thing. And so number one, we must view the ministry as gifts. That's what God has. God gave them. Christ gave them to us. Christ, is, he's the head of his church and he called them gifts. We must understand that their role is to fully equip us for the work of the ministry. I want to read this verse 12 in the Amplified Bible uh, because it's just really powerful. His intention was the perfecting and full equipping of the saints is consecrating people that they should do the work of ministering toward the building up of Christ's body, the church. So if I'm doing this right, you all are going to show up to fellowships like you did on Friday night and you're going to fellowship and love one another. You're going to come together, whether I'm here or not, and pray one for another and preach to one another and uplift one another and encourage one another. That is a church that is being equipped to do the work of the ministry. And that's what this is all about. It was never to be a one man show. It was never. God never intended for the church to be a one man show. Now, there is scripture that tells us that when the when they would come together, that Paul was the chief speaker. You're always going to have that in the church. You're going to have that apostolic office where God's going to put uh, that 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 authority uh, on that man. But it was never God's intention for that one man to be the sum total of all things. If you're in a church being underdeveloped because the pastor has to do everything, you got to go find somewhere to grow. Because I'm going to tell you something. God's not going to hold him responsible for your lack of growth. He's going to hold you responsible because you have the same word that he has. That's the reason why Brother Jonathan, Brother David, Brother Justin, uh, Brother Earl, Brother Calvin, Brother Joe. I let those men work. Why? Because they got to grow. They got to grow in their gifting. They got to grow in their calling. My job is to bring the church to a place where it is fully equipped to do the work of the ministry. And we saw a little bit of that around here this weekend. Amen. We've seen it before, but we saw it as well on this weekend. It was so powerful, so wonderful. My heart was, I'm telling you, saints, I was sitting in the airport looking at the, the doorbell out there. It's all these people coming in on this Sunday morning. No, and I'm not going to be here. I watched the service when I got uh, to Asheville and was driving home. And I saw God move and the word of God go, my God, thank you, Jesus. Finally doing something right around here. Number three, they're to establish us in the truth so that we are stable and secure from the deception of the enemy. Go with me to 2 Timothy 3 and verse 1. Chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3. And of course, Paul is giving this incredible warning uh, to his son Timothy. He said, this know also that in the last last days perilous times uh, shall come. This is going to happen. Uh, Times of great stress and trouble, hard to deal with and hard to bear. That's coming. I'm reading from the Amplified Bible. For people will be lovers of self. And utterly self-centered. Lovers of money. And aroused by an inordinate greedy desire for wealth. Proud and arrogant. Contemptuous boasters. They will be abusive, blasphemous, scoffing. Disobedient to parents. Ungrateful unholy and profane. They will be without natural human affection, callous and inhuman. I mean, I don't know how, he's just describing where we're at. 
He is describing the 21st century. I mean, he is completely describing this. Said, uh, re relentless, admitting of no truce or appeasement. They will be slanderers, false accusers, and troublemakers. Intemperate means completely without self-control. And loose in morals and conduct. Uncontrolled and fierce and haters of good. They will be treacherous betrayers. Rash and inflated with self-conceit. They will be lovers of sensual pleasures and vain amusements more than and rather than lovers of God. Have you ever seen the sports world? Let's, I, I'll just use that for an example. There are many things I could use as an example. But let's talk about athletics. I love athletics from a standpoint of, 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 of I, watch, I love competition. But people will go to a football game Every chance they can get, they will sit in those seats for five hours in all kinds of inclement weather. They will cheer on their team no matter how badly they're doing. They will scream and yell for their little idols running up and down a field with a football in their hand. And they won't spend a few minutes couple hours in the house of God to worship God. Parents will take their children instead of bringing them to the church on Sunday and letting them be taught the word of God. They'll take them to play baseball. They'll take them to run in parks. Problem is, is at the end of the age, is baseball going to save them? Is football going to save them? Is basketball going to save them? Absolutely not. Jesus is the only thing that's going to save them. And this is the gate of heaven. The church, if, if you're not getting in there without the church. You're not going in without the church. Because if you can't submit, listen, the church is preparing us for the theocratic kingdom of Jesus Christ. We're going to talk about authority here in a minute. But it's preparing us for the theocratic kingdom of Jesus Christ. If I can't be faithful to church... I'm going to resurrect in the first resurrection and rule and reign with Christ. If I can't submit to the authority of the ministry that he gave, but I'm going to submit to the authority of Christ in the resurrection and rule and reign with Jesus Christ. I'm going to be self-centered and selfish, whether it be in my time, whether it be in my labor, whether it be in my finances, I'm going to be greedy and selfish. But when I resurrect, I'm going to be selfless and sacrificial. This is just not going to happen. But that's because we love this fickle entertainment. We love, people don't mind, they'll go blow $100 at a movie theater. Won't give $5 to the offering. But when they resurrect, <laughs> God, it's just not going to happen. The church is preparing us to rule and reign with Christ. Why do I need to be faithful to church? Because this is the place of your preparation. Can't follow rules, but you're going to follow rules when you get into the kingdom. Can't submit to authority, but you're going to submit to the authority in the kingdom. Can't be selfish, selfless here, but you're going to be selfless in the kingdom. None of that is going to happen. This is, the, this is your preparation for the coming kingdom of Jesus Christ. We're talking about the knowledge of the glory of God taken by his ambassadors to cover the face of the earth as the waters cover the sea. But I won't tell anybody about Jesus in the, in the, in the, in the, in the supermarket. I won't tell anybody about Jesus at the gas station. I won't talk about Jesus at work. I won't tell anybody about Jesus in the restaurant. But you're going to take in the resurrection the gospel. And you're going to cover this. No, no, it's not going to happen. All of this is prep. This is preparation for you coming into the kingdom. And that's why you need to be in the church. It's not about a moral obligation. You need to be prepared for the coming of Jesus Christ. And you can't do that in the world. You can't do that sitting at a ball field. You can't do that sitting in a movie theater. You got to be in the church. Amen. Praise God. He said lovers of sensual pleasure more than lovers of God. 
For although they hold a form of piety, they, they seem to be religious. They deny and reject and are strangers to the power of it. Well, I'm a Christian. I know Jesus. But you won't submit. You won't get your heart right. You won't let God direct your life. You won't, you won't come under authority. That is the power of this thing. It's transforming us. We as human beings are not naturally willing to submit to any authority. We're not. We are rebellious by nature. We are. We want to do our own thing and we want to do it our own way. So the Lord brings us into the church, puts authority over our life. And guess what you've got to do? You've got to die every single day until you can submit to that authority willingly. You come into the church, it's hard at first, man. You, I mean, you're just every minute. But as you die to yourself, all right, Lord, this is the authority. And as long as they're leading me by the word of God, I submit. Lord, I'll do what I'm asked to do. I'll go where I'm asked to go. I'll, 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 I'll make the changes I'm asked to make by the word of God. These are, this is the Lord preparing you to submit to him in his kingdom. But can't do that on a ball field. Can't do that in a movie, movie theater. Can't do that in a concert hall. Can't do that out in a park. You got to come into the church because that's what's getting you ready. So we have to understand that men of God are given for this, for this reason. He said, avoid all such people and turn away from them. For among them are those who worm their way into homes and captivate silly and weak natured and spiritually dwarfed women, loaded down with the burden of their sin and easily, and easily swayed and led away by various evil desires and seductive impulses. These weak women will listen to anybody who will teach them. They are forever inquiring and getting information, but never able to arrive at a recognition and a knowledge of the truth. Real men of God will take the word of God by the spirit of God and they will remove that silliness out of your heart. They will remove, they'll rem they will put a sobriety in you. They will, they will so implant the word of God into your heart that there's nobody could come to you and deceive you away from the truth. That is our responsibility as men of God. And that's the reason why I can't handle this. We don't need doctrine. You know what that tells me when I hear preachers say we don't need doctrine? That tells me I'm lazy, I'm incompetent, and I refuse to do the hard work that is necessary to gain the information that is required to teach God's people. That's exactly what it tells me. Because there's not a man of God who loves to study the word of God, who loves the word of God, who would give his life for the word of God that would ever make a statement that we don't need doctrine. Because the more you study and the more it impacts your life, you go, Lord, we don't have enough. God, we need some more. Teach us some more. God, open up my mind some more. That is our job. Men of God, that's your primary responsibility. Visiting the sick in the hospital is a wonderful thing, but that's not their primary responsibility. Going and making sure people have their needs met, that's a wonderful thing. That's not the primary responsibility for a man of God who's overseeing a flock. The primary responsibility of every man of God is to take the word of God and put it into the hearts of the sheep. And that takes study time. You can't watch television on Monday through Friday and then wake up Saturday morning and prepare for sermons. David said, blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor sitteth in the seat of, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of scornful, but his delight is in the law of God. And in that law doth he meditate day and night. Man, I studied all Saturday. Are you serious? You didn't study Monday? 
You didn't read the word on Tuesday. You had no time for it on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Or, but, but Saturday, when you're at crunch time and you've got to have a sermon, then you study. A lot of them probably go to sermoncentral.net and just print off a sermon. That is not a responsible man of God. We have a responsibility. Do you all remember when, when the dispute happened between the Grecian and the Hebrew women? Now, again, the Grecian women were not Greek women. They were not Gentiles. They were Hebrew women who had taken on Hellenistic culture, and therefore they called them Grecians. At this point, the gospel had not yet been taken unto the Gentiles until Peter does it uh, through uh, Cornelius. And so ultimately here, uh, Peter, or, or, or they're, they're, they're suffering because the Grecian women may be some prejudice in the early church against non-traditional Jews, uh, which we see through the argument between circumcision and uncircumcision. And so ultimately they're being, the Grecian women are being neglected. The widows are being neglected in the daily administration. So they come to the apostles with this argument and they said, it is not meat for us. That we should leave the word of God in prayer and wait tables. Our primary responsibility is to feed you the word of God. Because that's heaven and earth shall pass away. But my word will never pass away. That's the eternal thing that is going to prepare you for the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And is going to make you a functional participant in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And so when I hear men, we don't need doctrine. You're just irresponsible. Lazy. Incompetent. That's what it boils down to. It just means I don't want to do the hard work that it would take to study. I didn't study this. It didn't take me five minutes to come up with this message. I've been working on it for a while now. I was working on it in the hotel. I was working on it in the airport. Been working on it all day long. Worked on it a couple days before that. Why? Because that's my responsibility. That's my job. The message I preached on Sunday night. I was studying that this week. Why? Because that's my job. And if you're going to be derelict in your responsibilities, just let somebody else do it. I'm talking about responsibility of ministry here. We need men of God that will raise up and take some responsibility. We need men of God who will raise up and love the word of God. And every time they hear somebody say, we don't need doctrine, we need men of God to look them in the face and say, well, all scripture was given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable. By, by the way, one of the things it's profitable to is doctrine. <laughs> it's just ridiculous, I know, but that's what the scripture says. But we need men of God who love the sheep. We don't need any more hirelings. We've had enough hirelings. We need true shepherds that say, Lord, you have given me responsible to the responsibility of overseeing this flock. How can I help them to grow in you? How can I build them up into you? So that when they die, they're ready for the kingdom. They're ready for the first resurrection. They're ready for it. Amen. Praise God. Go with me to 1 Timothy 4 and verse 13. I hope we're getting something out of this because I'm telling you. I hope there's a lot of preachers watching right now. People can say, well, who are you to tell me what to do? I'm not. The scripture is. But here in 1 Timothy 4 and verse 13. Now here's what Paul told his son in the gospel, Timothy. He said, till I come, give attendance to reading. Study. Isn't that what he told him? Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. He said, till I come, I want you to give uh, some attention to reading. To exhortation and to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by the pro by the pro by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things. Now listen, all you men of God, I'm called. I want to be God. This is what Paul tells his son Timothy. And by the way, in case we didn't know it, Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles, so we should really take this seriously. I mean, this was. Incredible uh, admonishment. Mm -hmm. Meditate on these things. Give thyself wholly to them. Completely to them. That thy profiting might appear to all. Take heed unto thyself. And to unto the doctrine. Continue in them. 
For in doing so, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Amen. That is our responsibility. I mean, if we're not going to teach doctrine, there's no purpose for us. Anybody can stand up and motivate people. It doesn't take a great person to motivate people, but it takes a disciplined man to understand the scripture. Why? Because he has to search them. He has to read. He has to study. He has to reference. All of these things are necessary, and that takes more than just a Saturday morning. It takes you continually attending unto them and giving yourself only to them so that you could save yourself, yes, but also all them that hear you. And so that is responsibility of ministry. The responsibility of ministry is to feed the flock of God. Go with me to um, uh, go with me to Jeremiah three and verse fifteen. I studied all Saturday and they didn't even act like I was talking. That's probably because all you did was study on Saturday. Jeremiah 3 and verse 15. The Lord says this to Israel. He said, and I'm reading from the Amplified, and I will give you spiritual shepherds after mine own heart in the final time who will feed you with knowledge and understanding and judgment. He said, in the end time, I'm going to raise up shepherds after my heart, who will teach you, will feed you with knowledge and understanding. Why? Because the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. How do we know God? By the preaching of the word. How can we know? How can I know except someone teach me? And how can he teach save he be sent? It takes the teaching of the word of God to produce these people in Daniel 11 who are strong, even in the time of persecution. Daniel 11, when, when the Lord is speaking of those who are strong, he's talking about people who are being persecuted. But then they that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. If I'm not feeding them doctrine, if I'm not teaching them the word of God, who will they know? Who will they know? What will they do? They will crumble. They will be, they will, they, they will be offended. They'll fall away. They'll depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. Let me help us. People are going to go after doctrine one way or the other. One way or the other. Whether it's truth or whether it's false, they're going to follow doctrine. Because the Bible said in, in the last days that many would depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. It's doctrine that leads them away. It's going to be doctrine that causes them to stay. One way or the other, they're going after doctrines. So we can sit in the middle ground and say, well, I'm not teaching doctrine. Okay, they're going to follow the doctrines of devils. That's just the way it is because they're going after doctrine in the last days one way or the other. So the Lord said, I'm going to give you spiritual shepherds after my heart in the last time that will feed you with knowledge and understanding and judgment. That's a powerful verse, isn't it? Isn't that an awesome verse? Go with me to uh, Daniel 11 and verse 32. 11 and verse 32. This is talking about the coming of the man of sin, the coming of the Antichrist, uh, of which Antiochus Epiphanes is a he's a precursor. He's, he wasn't the Antichrist because ultimately Antiochus Epiphanes, I think it's something like 135 years or something like that. 
before Christ came, he went into uh, the temple of God and polluted it by uh, setting up idols and offering pigs upon the altar. But Jesus then later on says in, 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 in the Gospels, he says, when you shall see the abomination of desolation standing where it ought not, flee to the mountains. And so it's not possible that Antiochus Epiphanes was the abomination of desolation, but he was definitely a precursor. He was a foreshadowing of what is to come. And so here, this man of sin comes, uh, and, and such as violate the covenant, he shall pervert and seduce with flatteries. But the people who know their God. So ultimately, you've got a deceiver coming. He's going to deceive people who pervert the covenant, who, who, who are rebellious, who are, who are filled with iniquity. He's going he's gonna to seduce them and deceive them. So ultimately, these are children of God. He comes in with flatteries and deceives them and turns them away. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. So the people that have knowledge and understanding and judgment, these people will not be deceived by this antichrist figure. They will not be deceived by this man of sin. Why? Because they will have knowledge. Go with me to 2 Thessalonians 2. And by the way, some of this is off the cuff because the Lord just touched my mind while I'm talking. And I, I'm reading again from the Amplified. But, but, rel re but relative to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and our gathering together to meet him, when are we going to gather to meet him? When he comes. <laughs> that's pretty simple. I mean... I believe people already meet him. Well, that's not what Paul said. He said, we meet him when he comes. We, we beg you, brethren, not to allow your minds to be quickly unsettled or disturbed or kept excited or alarmed, whether it be by some pretend revelation of the spirit or by word or letter alleged to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has already arrived and is here. He said, look, I don't want you to be deceived. People come, I believe the Lord could come tomorrow. No, he cannot come tomorrow. You may, your time may be up tomorrow. I will not, I will not deny you that. But the fact of the matter is there is a lot of prophecy yet to be fulfilled before the coming of the Lord. And so Paul's saying there are people who are fraudulently sending out letters saying that, signing it as if it were from us, that we're telling you the day of the Lord is at hand. He said, don't be deceived. Let no one deceive you or beguile you in any way. For that day will not come except the apostasy, or King James says the falling away, comes first, unless the predicted great falling away of those who have professed to be Christians has come. And the man of lawlessness or sin is revealed, who is the son of doom of perdition. This has to happen first. Who opposes and exalts himself pro so proudly and instantly against and over all that is called God or that is worshipped, even to his uh, even to his actually taking his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming that he himself is God. Now, I want to tell you, we already have somebody doing that. And he's going to go into Jerusalem. It has been and I don't have time to teach this tonight, but I will in another Bible study. But it has been the objective of Roman Catholicism to take Jerusalem over since its inception. They do not. I'm telling you, they are satisfied right now to stay in the Vatican. But they are not going to be satisfied to stay there forever. Uh, if, if you look at the Crusades, we hear the Crusades. Oh, it was the Christians going in and taking Jerusalem back from uh, from 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 the Islamic from Islamic power and control. But you have to go back to the history. And the fact that it was the Catholic Church who financed Muhammad uh, to go in and, and, and even gave him military power to go in and take Jerusalem. Now, when he got there, he crossed them up and he said, no, I'm going to stay here in Jerusalem because ultimately Jerusalem really has no significant prior to Muhammad coming in. The Jerusalem has no significance to the Islamic world. Mecca is their capital. That's where Muhammad was born. 
And so ultimately, there is no significance to them other than they believe that from the Temple Mount, Muhammad ascended uh, to Allah. That's the only significance it has. But prior to then, it was the Roman Catholic Church under the guise of Muhammad and his crusaders taking over Jerusalem so that they would in turn give Jerusalem to Roman Catholicism and the Pope could set up his throne in Jerusalem by the which he would take uh, the theocratic government of God and establish it around the world. He is considered in all Roman Catholicism as the vicar of Christ. Now the word vicar has the connotation as a servant or one who carries a briefcase. But the vicar of Christ has a whole different understanding. The vicar of Christ is the one who stands instead of Christ. And they believe that after the conclave, when they have voted in that pope, that Christ uh, inhabits that body and that pope becomes an infallible deity. And all of his proclamations become absolute because he is Christ on earth. So they believe. You can read it. They'll tell you. They're, they're, not, they're not ashamed of it. That's what they believe. And so I believe at the end of the age, this is going to take place once again. This ultimately will take place and that, that they will take power. And, and he will indeed stand in the city of God in Jerusalem and declare himself to be what he believes himself to be. And that is the embodiment of God on earth. And that's going to take place and we better be looking for it. I do not believe this is going to be a Muslim cleric because you couldn't deceive the saints. The Bible said that if it were possible, the very elect would be deceived. You're not going to deceive the elect of God with Islam. But you can deceive the elect of God by perpetuating yourself as a Christian and as some great power of God. And so we need to be watchful, saints of God. That's your job, men of God, is to get the people ready for this coming. Because everybody else is going to be deceived by flatteries. But the people that do know their God, it's that simple. The people that have wisdom and knowledge and judgment, they will be strong and they will do exploits for God. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful, saints? What, what, a, what a Savior. But he says here in verse uh, uh, 33 of Daniel 11. And they who are wise and understanding among the people will do what? Will instruct many. And make them understand. Though some of them and their followers shall fall by the sword and flame by captivity and plunder for many days. He said, look, those who have knowledge, who's, who's that supposed to be? It's supposed to be the men of God. It's supposed to be the ministry. Now, the saints are supposed to study, too. I'm not taking that away from them. They have a responsibility. But the ministry are those who God has called to disseminate the word of God amongst the saints. So it's the men of God who are studied, who have understanding, who have wisdom and knowledge that will also in turn cause others to have understanding, wisdom and knowledge. That's our job. So when I hear don't, we don't need doctrine, that is just absolute laziness. That's all that is. Well, I don't want to be divisive. Doctrine is divisive. Of course it is. That's what the word of God was. There. Jesus said, think not that I'm come to bring peace, but a sword. And I will set a variance between father and son, between mother and daughter and mother-in-law and daughter-in-law. The word of God does divide. And we can't just they say, well, you know, we don't need to know this. And this is really not important. Once we start dividing the word of God up and what is important and what isn't important, we are already in serious trouble. Every word of God is important. All scripture was given by inspiration of God and is profitable. It's profitable. <sighs> Go with me to Acts 20, verse 28. And the reason why I'm hammering on this responsibility of the ministry before I talk about the response of the saints is because we need to see a ministry raise up that has a serious understanding of their responsibility. 
We talked about the qualifications of their calling the last time, but now we need to really, really begin to understand our responsibility. Because if we don't, man, again, God's just going to replace us. He's going to take us out and put somebody at the wheel. For, frankly, saints, God has done so much for me. I just don't want to fail him now. I want to know that I'm pleased the Lord. I want to know that I'm pleased him. But here in Acts 20 and verse 28, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. Number one, take heed to yourself. Make sure your behavior is that becoming a man of God. Make sure your character uh, is impeachable. Does not mean that you're perfect. Does not mean that you will not have flaws. Does not mean that there is still not stuff that God's working out of your life. We're, we're all clay on the potter's wheel. But there's a difference between a struggle with sin and having impeachable character. And that all has to do with motivation. Whether I really want to be right before God or whether I'm in a position where I feel like I am uh, unquestionable, where I feel like I'm unaccountable, and therefore I can do what I want and still profit from this thing. That's not a man of God who's taken heed to himself. You know, having mistresses and being uh, being uh, lustful of gain and and power and influence. That's not a man of God who's taking heed to himself, because ultimately God's going to bring that stuff out, and all it's going to do is destroy the saints. And a man who loves, you say, Pastor, do you ever get tempted? Are you kidding me? Do I look like I'm in an angelic body? Do I look like I'm in an immortal body? Of course, temptation comes. But when you're taking heed to yourself, number one, you're saying, if I do any of this, I'm lost. And then two, if I do it, the saints are destroyed. Is this worth it? Absolutely not. And you dismiss that temptation quickly because you have weighed it against the value of it against the chaos that it will cause. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. It's just not worth it. I'm telling you, it's not worth it. But here in Acts 20, 20, he said, take heed to yourself and to the flock over which the Holy Ghost had made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he, Jesus Christ, hath purchased with his own blood. Amen. My God, Amen. if we ever understand the value of God's people, my Lord, if, I'm telling you, if men of God will ever understand what God has put in their trust, these are not just beings that they can manipulate and play with. These are the saints of the living God. The Bible said in the days he will make up his jewels. These are jewels to God, precious, for which Christ purchased them with his own blood. And to be reckless, to be chaotic, to be irresponsible and lazy. My God, no, those men don't understand. A man that acts like that, immature, irresponsible, unsettled, chaotic, confused, won't study, won't teach, won't hold people accountable, won't correct, won't rebuke, won't reprove. That man doesn't understand who he's gotten his charge. He sees them as just entities. When I look at this church and I see it filled up with people, I don't see these as my sounding board, as my audience. These are the saints. We're going to have a meeting here in September that, that we'll be bringing saints in. We won't be able to have it here, but we'll have, we'll have it at another facility. You know what we do when, when, we go, when we have our meeting? We go into that facility and we clean it from top to bottom. You want to know why? Because the saints of God are coming. We have dinner for them. We prepare meals for them. You want to know why? Because they're the saints of God. We serve them with humility. We serve them with all of our heart. You want to know why? Because they're the saints of God. We pray and ask God to deliver and make a great move in that meeting. Why? Because the saints of God are coming. Amen. That's the mentality we must have. These are God's children. And so when I, I, don't, I don't teach doctrine. Doctrine is... You know, I, I heard a man say, well, I didn't hear him say, but I heard someone tell me, he said, doctrine is what preachers do when they have nothing better to do. 
What? Are you out of your ever-loving mind? That is your call. That is the craziest thing I've ever heard. That man has no regard for the people that are in his charge. He doesn't realize who's in his charge. These are the saints. These are the jewels. These are precious in the sight of God. And you are given charge over them to feed them and prepare them for the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Mm -mm, not something to take lightly. Go with me to 1 Peter 5 and verse 1. I love, man, I, I, I'm telling you, these, these brothers in our church, from Brother Calvin and Brother Job and Brother Earl and Brother David and Brother Justin, Brother Jonathan, those that are feeling the call to be in ministry, man, one of the things I love about them is their love for the word. Ah, I love men who love the word. I'm telling you, I love them deeply. I love them deeply because they love the word. They love it. So Peter says here, the elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God, which is among you. Peter's just repeating what the Lord told him. Peter, lovest thou me more than these? Feed my lambs. Peter, lovest, me more than, lovest thou me more than these? Feed my sheep. Good God. My Lord in heaven, what a responsibility. What an honor. Can you imagine that God would call you to feed his sheep? How could you take that lightly? How could that be something fickle to you? Who... Out of the millions upon millions of people that exist on planet Earth, he called you to feed his sheep. I don't see how you don't look at it with honor. My God, it's the most wonderful thing ever. How could you not love it? How could you not give yourself for it? He said, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly. In other words, you don't have the right to demand that people submit to you. They have to do this willingly. And this is getting ready to lead into the responsibility of the saints. Because I have watched a lot of overlords in my lifetime get into the church and bully themselves around and demand and force that obedience. That's not doing anything in that child of God's life. You cannot demand obedience by coercion. Obedience and submission is something that has to be willingly given by the sheep. Amen. Amen. Not for filthy lucre, don't do it for money, but of a ready mind. My God, take it seriously. Take what you're doing seriously. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. My God goodness what an awesome thing what a powerful thing I hope I'm giving a lot of people a lot to think about right now a lot of scripture a lot of scripture know who you're talking to know who you're ministering to know who you're overseeing you're not overseeing some 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 half-witted nothing out there these are the children of God you don't have the right to demand obedience that's something they have to give but you got to feed them now, a child of God that will not give obedience and submission, there's just as much in rebellion as the guy that won't teach doctrine. Because it takes both of them fulfilling their responsibilities. There's a responsibility from the ministry, and then there's responsibility to the ministry. Amen. I hope this is all coming together for you guys. Starting to really bring the picture together. Go with me to Hebrews 13 and verse 17. I'm going to read this from the Amplified Bible. Praise God. Man, it's a little warm in here. Somebody turn the air on. Y'all warm or y'all fine? Uh, y'all see how much I love y'all? You see how much I love y'all? I'm with the air on, but I'll, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll, I'll just sit here and take it. I'll take it. 
He is gone. I'll take it. 13 and verse 17. And I want you to hear this because this uh, is your responsibility to the ministry. Not from, but this is your responsibility to the ministry. This is the saints in their responsibility to the ministry. Obey your spiritual leaders and submit to them, continually recognizing their authority over you. Now, like I said, we are all born and <laughs> we're just rebellious. And it takes dying to yourself to submit to authority. It really does. It takes, well, I don't, somebody said, well, I, I submit to my leader. Let, let me give you a piece of advice. Submission is not ever found in agreement. Submission is found in disagreement. It's when they do something that you don't like. That's when really the submission is found. Whether Now, as long as it's not apostate or it's not heretical, but it's just something you don't personally like, but you still submit anyways. That's our responsibility as people to the ministry. We have a responsibility to them. And one of our responsibility is to submit to them continually recognizing their authority over us. Because these are gifts. These are not just guys. These are not just your buddy, your bro, your pal, your homie. These are the men of God who have been given to the church. Help you to grow into Christ, which is the head. And so when you have a man of God who's doing that, your response to him is, Lord, I'm going to recognize his authority and I'm going to obey and submit to that authority. And if he's a real man of God, he's never going to ask you to obey something that is not in the word of God. It's never going to happen. He'll always take you to the word of God and say, well, that's it. Now obey the word of God. Because ultimately, if a man of God is giving me the word of God and I rebel against him, though he's giving me the word of God, I'm not rebelling against him. I'm really rebelling against God. Because God gave that man. He gave that apostle. He gave that prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. He gave that man of God. And so how I respond to him is very important. It is equally important as if he's teaching me, if he's developing, if he's correcting me rebuking, reproving, exhorting, encouraging. If he's doing his job, I have an equal important responsibility to respond with submission and obedience, with a continual recognition of authority. Because sometimes pastors can get too familiar to us and we see them just as our buddy. But that's not who they are. These are the men of God. These are the men of God. Now they'll never ever demand worship. A real man of God will never demand worship. But your response from a heart that is grateful for the gift that has been given to you will always be obedience and honor and a continual recognition of authority. It's powerful, isn't it? Isn't it an incredible thing? We all have our responsibility. For they are constantly keeping watch over your souls and guarding your spiritual welfare as men who will have to render an account of their trust. So this church operates on what is called a trust deed. Okay, I'm going to give you some, as my wife would say, practical application. So our church operates off a trust deed. So everything in our possession, whether it be facilities, whether it be finances, everything within our possession, we are accountable to make sure to God, and in some cases uh, to, the, to, to, to legal channels, to make sure that we are keeping that trust in credibility. That we're taking care of our facility. That just as much as a, a husband and wife are, are charged by God with a responsibility in their own home to make sure that what God has given them, they're taking care of it. We are also charged as men of God to watch over this because we're going to give an account for you. Now, if you rebel against the word of God, I won't have to answer to that. But I will have to answer to God whether I gave you the word which caused you to choose to obey or rebel. And I have to give an account for that trust. 
He said, do your part to let them do this with gladness and not with sighing and groaning, for that would not be profitable to you either. Our responsibility is to obey and submit and to do it happily, to do it joyfully, to do it with gratitude, just as much as I am grateful that God has given me you wonderful saints to oversee and to teach and to guide, then you must also in turn show that gratitude to God for having given you men of God who will do that for you. And do it joyfully. I don't pastor this church begrudgingly. I hear men complaining about their churches and I think, my goodness, then it's about you. Because if you really knew who you were pastoring, you wouldn't complain about them. Does that mean it doesn't get discouraging at times? Does that mean it doesn't get frustrating? Of course it does. You're dealing with humanity. But then when you sit back for a moment and you think, but still, I've got the greatest job on planet Earth. Brother Joe Garrett, I was on the phone with him today. He said something that was, that was great. He said, you will never, ever be in trouble in marriage as long as you think you got the best deal out of it. He said, it's the same way in the church. You will never be in trouble as long as you look at the church and say, I'm really the one that got the better deal out of this. That was a powerful statement. I thought, well, praise God. Amen. So, Sean, I'm going to work on that. I got the better deal. All right. I got the better deal. <laughs> I got the better deal. <laughs> But ultimately, do, do that with gladness. Do that with a joyful spirit. As long as what they're guiding you by, directing you by, correcting you by, encouraging you by, is the word of God, be happy. Be happy that God gave you somebody that cared about you, that loved you. A lot of men out there lying in wait and deceived. There's only really a few true men of God left who are doing this for the right motivation. Amen? Then he said, Keeping, keep praying for us, for we are convinced that we have a good, clear conscience, that we want to walk uprightly and live a noble life. This is responsibility of men, of God, to live a noble and honorable life, acting honorably and in complete honesty in all things. That's our responsibility. He said, I beg of you to pray for us the more earnestly in order that I may be restored to you, the sinner. The response of God's children is pray for their leaders. Pray for them. Humbly submit. Humbly obey. Do it with a grateful heart and then pray for them. Listen, we face so many attacks and they come constantly on us because the enemy knows if he can strip the church of good men of God, he can get the flock. He knows it. Strike the shepherd, the sheep will scatter. He knows that. He read it too. So when you, when you guys think of your leaders, me, the elders and ministers of the church, pray for us. Pray for us because the enemy's out there after us. He's head hunting. He's wanting, he's, wanting it. He's, wanting to, he's wanting to get us out of here. So pray for us. Part of your responsibility to us is also to pray for us. And it's to pray that God will give us great doors of utterance, open great doors of utterance, that God will give us wisdom and knowledge. And if we will do that, listen, if, if you will pray for the pastor that you're under, you won't have so many problems with him. A lot of people who have constant problems with their pastor never pray for them. But if you really pray for your pastor, you won't have so many problems with him. It's the truth. God will put a love in your heart. God will put an admiration in your heart. God will put an honor in your spirit for him. And so, so pray for your pastors. Pray for your leaders. God give them to you. Um, whew, there's so much here. There's so much here. Go with me to Ephesians 6 and verse 18. Six and verse 18. 
Pray at all times and on every occasion in every season in the spirit. <laughs> Amen. With all manner of prayer and entreaty. To that end, keep alert and watch with strong purpose and perseverance, interceding in behalf of all the saints, God's consecrated people. And then Paul said, and pray also for me, that freedom of utterance may be given me, that I may open my mouth to proclaim boldly the mysteries of the gospel. He said, pray for me also. So saints of God, when you're in your time of prayer, pray for your leaders. Well, my goodness, we don't ever hear anything. We don't ever hear anything new. We don't ever hear anything. Then pray for them. Pray that God will touch their minds and open up their spirits and feed you with mysteries, with knowledge and understanding. Pray for them. Pray for them. Go with me to uh, Colossians 4 and verse 2. And of course, Paul is pretty much saying the same thing here. It's almost the same thing. It's just using different uh, vernacular. He said, be earnest and unwearied and steadfast in your prayer life, being both alert and intent in your praying with thanksgiving. And at the same time, pray for us also that God may open a door to us for the word to proclaim the mystery concerning Christ on account of which I am in prison that I may proclaim it fully and make it clear, speak boldly and unfold that mystery as is my duty. That's my job. That's your job, period. So pray for us that God will give us boldness, that God will give us wisdom and understanding. Pray for us. We need it. That's your response to us. That's your responsibility to us, that you will pray that God will give us boldness and that God will give us wisdom and clarity and an open door to preach the word of God, which is our responsibility. First Timothy five and verse 17. I hope a lot of the saints are watching this right now because of the ministry. And if the saints will do their part, whoa, right. what a work of God. Amen. What a work of God. Amen. Now, the King James Version uses this word honor. But if you look it up in the Greek, it, it's talking about finances. It's talking about money. I know preachers, man, I... You know, always wanting to be paid something. I mean, listen to this. Pastors who do their work well should be paid well and should be highly appreciated, especially those who work hard at both preaching and teaching. I mean, that's just it. Why? He said, for the scriptures say, Never tie up the mouth of an ox when it is treading out the grain. Let him eat as he goes along. And in another place, it says those who work deserve their pay. And so a congregation that has a man of God in it who's working hard to preach and to teach that congregation, who's doing their job well. Paul says here that they're worthy of double honor or rather that they should be paid well and held in high regard, highly appreciated, highly appreciated. I've known churches that have had great men of God in it, and they didn't appreciate them. They didn't appreciate them. They saw them as, you know, well, you work for us. No, they work for Christ. No, no pastor ever works for the congregation. He works for Jesus Christ. He's the gift given. His boss is Jesus Christ, which I would wish we would take that actually seriously, that we're answering to the Lord. We're not answering to the deacon board. We're not answering to the congregational. Uh, in, in, there are congregational churches that I know. And that pastor answers to that congregation. He stands up and preaches and teaches something they don't like. They'll vote him right out and put somebody else in. 
That is a blasphemy. That is blasphemous. If you are in a congregationalist church, get out. I'm just telling you. You have no right to dictate the ministry. You don't have the right. Either God will send someone and put them in there. You don't put them in there. You don't put the ministry in the church. The Bible says that God does that. He's the one that calls. And that man of God, if he's doing that job well, if he's giving attention to preaching and to teaching and to study of the word, Paul says, pay him very well. Hold with high appreciation. That's the response of the congregation. Because you don't bridle the ox that treads out the corn. And the workman is worthy of his hire. That's what the King James says. So ultimately, that is part of the responsibility of the congregation. So all these, now I get it. There are guys out there making multiplied millions of dollars. And they're charlatans. They're shysters. I get that. I'm not discounting any of that at all. But not every man of God is a charlatan. And somebody said, well, I don't think a preacher should make that much money. What? You pay him what he's worth. You pay him highly for what he's worth. That's, that's, to me, that doesn't make any sense. If you went to your job and you were working really hard and they came to you and said, you know what, we think we're just going to pay you minimum wage, you would feel very appreciated. <laughs> so if you have a man of God in your church that's doing what I want to talk, our church does that. I have no complaints in it. Our church does a wonderful job. I, I appreciate our church very much. I really do. I appreciate them very much. But if you've got a man of God that is teaching and preaching, to you. Don't you ever feel defrauded by paying him. Yeah. Don't you ever do it. Because he's worthy of it. You pay him well. And you appreciate him highly. Amen. That's, that's part of your response. That's part of the congregation's response to that man of God. The 19th verse. Don't listen to complaints against the pastor Unless there are two or three witnesses to accuse him. I don't like it. Oh, stop, 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 stop. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Unless we got two or three witnesses that saw him do something. I'm not listening to it. You know how to stop the mouth of a gossip? By stopping the mouth of a gossip. That's how you do it. Nope, nope, nope. You're not talking, to, you're not talking about him to me. It's not happening. That's the man of God. God's put him on. And unless you've got two or three witnesses that saw him do what you're claiming he's done, stay away from me. I'm not listening to it. That's slander. That's gossip. And the Bible tells me that I am not to take an accusation against him unless there are two or three witnesses that saw it. Well, wouldn't that stop a whole lot of voting in and voting out? I mean, there are good men of God being destroyed by that system. Powerful men of God that could be incredibly valuable. To the work of God. But I've, I've known churches that vote a man out if he put the chandelier inside the sanctuary instead of in the hallway. I've known a church that did that. Voted the pastor out. Voted the pastor out because he changed the pulpit. He took the old pulpit out that was in there and he put a new one in and they voted him out. It's disgusting. But that is called congregationalist church. When the congregation has the authority of the church, there's nothing in the scripture that says the congregation has that kind of power. They've taken it upon themselves. I, I understand that it may have been necessary at times. I don't know if it was ever necessary because you can vote with your feet. I mean, if somebody's doing something awful, you can leave. But it was never God's will for the congregation to take the authority of the church, ever. But I'm sure you guys have heard of the same thing. You've watched men just be destroyed because somebody didn't like them, because somebody on the deacon board, which by the way, all you deacons out there that are so exalted in yourself that you think you, you are table waiters. Go look up the word deacon. Go look it up. You're supposed to be cleaning off tables, not voting in and out pastors. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. Well, God, take it to the deacon board. That wasn't their job. They were supposed to be feeding the widows and waiting on the tables. I don't see any of them deacons coming to this church anymore. If they're watching right now, they're like, I'm out of here. I'm done. Turn it off. Amen. We got a major problem in the church, though. It's upside down. It's upside down. Paul said, you follow me as I follow Christ. It's upside down. It's upside down. You need to get it back right. And I know men who could, I mean, who could be movers and shakers, who could be, 
have an incredible impact on the body of Christ, and they're terrified to say things in their church because they know it will result in them being fired. Just can't even imagine that. That was never God's intent. And, if, and, and I'm going to tell you, if you're in leadership in a church right now, you're watching, and your church is being run that way, and you love the pastor, and you have the ability to change that, change it right now. Change it right now. That's not ever God's intent. Now, if he does something, and there are two or three witnesses that watch it, we need to deal with that. But without that, don't ever receive an accusation against it. Don't ever do it. Don't listen to complaints. People are always going to have something to say. Well, I think he should not. No, 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 stop, 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 stop. No, that's not coming into my hearing because I don't want that getting my spirit. He, he teaches us. He preaches us. He lives a good and holy life. He cares about us. You're not going to talk about him in front of me. You take that garbage and you throw it in the trash can because these ears are not a dumpster for the filth that you're wanting to spew into my spirit. That's how you stop gossips. And people say, well, I can't. I, people just keep coming and talking to me because you're a gossip. You listen. That they would t- Listen, every gossip I ever shut down never came and talked to me again. Never did. They never said another word to me because they were like, Pastor Jerry's not going to listen to this. So if you shut them down, they'll never talk to you. If they keep talking to you, it's because you won't shut them down. I'm just telling you. It's helping you out. <sighs> There's so much here, but I don't think that I'm going to be able to get through it all. But the fact of the matter is, saints, is men of God are responsible, as we talked about, to teach, to oversee, to watch, to hold the saints accountable. To give them the word of God. They're not to be lords over God's heritage. There's, no, there's never to be an overlord. There's never to be that. They can't demand you submit. But you in turn have a responsibility to submit and to obey. And to take care. And to pay them well. And to, and to, and to appreciate them. And to, to, as they follow Christ. And to pray for them. And to lift them up before God. That God would speak powerfully to you through them. And so my... I heard somebody say one time, if everybody knew the law, there would be no lawyers. And if everybody knew how to do surgery, there would be no surgeons. And if everybody knew how to pastor, there would be no pastors. God has called them. He's given them insight and understanding that we need. And if if something, pray that God would put it in his spirit. Pray that God would put it on his heart. That's how we help the ministry. That's how we strengthen them. That's how Aaron and her lift up the hands of Moses. Because as long as they kept his hands up, Israel was getting the victory. And it's the same way in the church. As long as you keep the hands of the ministry who's fulfilling their responsibility. As long as you keep the hands one, you're always going to come out with victory. And so... I hope in this hour and 40 minutes we've had that I've done, that I've given you enough scripture to make you understand, number one, ministry, this is your responsibility. Number two, saints, this is your response. If we will do both of those adequately and with excellence, there'll be no mountain that we cannot move. There'll be no, there'll be no community that we cannot turn upside down. It is going to be something to behold as this church and as every church that is watching this and every saint that is watching this puts this word deep in their heart. I cannot wait to see the results. Amen. 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 Wash, pour water on the hands of the man of God. Amen. Paul talked about it. I'll I'll give you just uh, one portion of scripture that you can go to. It's Romans 16, verse 1 through 6. Read that. And look at all these people that Paul was saluting and thanking and commending because they helped him. And in a lot of uh, doxology or the uh, finishing of the chapters of Paul's epistles, he will mention people that helped him, people that took care of his needs, people that you know were there to support him. No man, Paul would have never been the great apostle if he hadn't had these people. And this church will never, ever reach its height if we decide today, oh, 
I'm not going to do my responsibility and I'm not going to fulfill my responsibility. If we, the other one, the other is, if we will keep on the trajectory that we are headed, we will all stand back in just a few years and go, look what the Lord has done. This is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. And so I hope this has helped us. I hope this has given us some information we need. Um, and, and, and really, you can apply a lot of this even to our homes uh, as men of God, as priests of our homes, as leaders of our homes, as wives and children, how we're to respond in our responsibility and our response uh, to each other. And we'll talk about that at a later time. Uh, but let's, let's do our job. If we will all do our job, this thing's going to be what it's supposed to be. All right, saints, God bless you guys. I hope this has been beneficial to you. I hope this has been a blessing. I hope you that are watching, that God has really spoke to your heart as well. And we pray that God will cause, allow this to impact many of the churches that we love and care about and watch them grow exponentially. I, I don't want this church to be the only shining star. I want every church that I fellowship and love, and really any church that is, is doing it the right way. I want to see them grow exponentially because that means we're reaching souls and people are being changed and transformed and prepared for the coming of Jesus Christ. All right. God bless you guys. Have a great night. We'll see you Wednesday.